session on uh, Perthes disease. So this is going to be a long and uh, uh, interesting uh, session because this is quite confusing even to date about what this particular disease is. And uh, it's an evolving condition and uh, orthopedic science has not reached a place where we can definitely tell that this is the particular cause of uh, Perthes disease and that's how you're going to treat it. Okay, so we'll try to divide this particular disease into four parts. First, we'll be talking about the history, etiopathogenesis, and the natural history. Uh, then uh, we'll be talking about the prognostic factors, uh, the various investigations that are done. And then we will talk about the classification systems and the treatment guidelines over the third week. And lastly, uh, for people who want to uh, practically treat these patients, we will talk about uh, in depth about the different treatment methods, be it bracing or uh, femoral surgeries or the acetabular surgeries. So uh, without uh, further delay, let's just jump into this particular problem, which is uh, like calvary Perthes disease. So uh, how did this start off? Uh, Perthes disease uh, back in the day was initially described in uh, 1909 and 1910 uh, in different papers at the same time in three different areas. Uh, that is by uh, Dr. Legg in Boston, USA, uh, by Calve in France, and by Perthes in Germany. And this is back in the day when we did not have WhatsApp or Telegram, and uh, uh, all three of them to have done it at the same time uh, makes, uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, logical that the disease is named after all three of them. So uh, what they described this condition is, that this is an obscure affliction of the hip. So we are talking about times where uh, we did not really know what exactly this thing is. So the only two conditions back in the day, which were definitely diagnosed in, in, in say pediatric and adults and children was one is the tuberculosis of the hip. And the second thing is the septic arthritis of the hip. Okay. And this particular condition mimicked uh, tuberculosis and was being treated as tuberculosis for a very, very long time. Okay. And that's where Waldenstrom comes in. Waldenstrom in the same time, in the same time period, that's between 1909 and 1910 has described uh, this particular condition as tuberculosis of the hip. Whereas like Calway and Perthes, uh, they find it either due to some sort of trivial trauma, due to some abnormal osteogenesis or due to an inflammatory condition which to date, we do not have a clear cut answer to. Okay. So uh, that's the initial description. And that's why these uh, four gentlemen have been, uh, uh, these three gentlemen in particular have been named after, uh, the disease has been named after. And of course, Wallenstrom from Sweden, who we should not forget because they, he also gave one of the uh, named uh, descriptions of this particular disorder. Okay. So coming to the etiology, uh, when we started off in the pre- uh, say radiological era that's between uh, that's before say 1905 where any and every hip condition was called an osteochondritis and soon after the development of uh, x-ray what happened what happened is uh, I think this was towards the end of the 19th century it's about 1895 if I'm not mistaken uh, when x-ray was discovered and uh, was invented rather and uh, uh, the X-ray machine within a cup within a few months was present all over uh, Western and Central Europe. The reason for that is because when something is really good, you do not need to uh, say uh, you do not need to uh, advertise about it. So X-ray was so good because it was allowing the doctors to see what's happening within without doing a surgery. So that is why within a few months of x-ray being discovered, the x-ray machine was present in the hospitals all over Western Europe. And that's the reason, uh, that's the time period where any and every overgrowth or outpouching of the bone was named after a particular doctor. So we had uh, Oscott Schlatter disease, we had the Freiburg's disease, we had uh, sending Larsen disease. Uh, so all these named osteochondrosis happened during this era right after x-ray was diagnosed and everybody was fond of naming a disease after themselves. Okay. And it was not later on or not until 1921 where histopathological, uh, histopathologically 
they try to examine these particular conditions and femester in 1921 found out that there is a combination of healing and necrotic bone intermingled with granulation tissue and osteoclasts so what does this show us that there is a combination of both catabolic and anabolic components that is both osteoblasts and osteoclasts are present in a soft tissue bed which has both necrotic bone and granulation tissue okay and this of course confirms because uh, because of the radiology of course because this is a aseptic necrosis which slowly revascularizes okay this uh, the staging of the disease is such that initially we have an aseptic necrosis which will lead to the osteoclast coming in followed by revascularization where osteoblasts come in okay however femister did not tell us whether this condition was due to inflammatory condition or infectious condition and the true etiology remained unanswered even back after the histopathological analysis then later in 1926 uh, the theory that disruption of the blood supply to the femoral head is the most important etiological factor came out as the forerunner or the most important etiological factor leading to perthes disease and different uh, pathologists surgeons and scientists uh, found out that different arteries can be occluded which would give rise to a perthes disease sort of a picture so initially it was thought that it's due to obstruction of the superior retinacular artery then it was told that lateral epiphyseal artery interruption causes perthes disease then we had the double infarction theory and then when all the vessels were taken off then they told that the blood itself is wrong that it's due to the increased blood viscosity and due to thrombophilia where there is increased clotting in these particular individuals okay so disruption of the blood supply to the femoral head okay so it's not just intravascular but also extravascular and mixed okay so that means not just the vessels but also the blood which runs inside them was deemed to be problematic in these particular children okay so uh, that's when the multifactorial sort of etiology came into being so it was told that both genetic factors and environmental factors are important for perthes disease to take place and later this was refined and it was told that it has to be a genetic susceptibility with an environmental trigger okay so the genetic susceptibility is something that most of us could be born with but until and unless there is an environmental trigger which is triggering this particular genetic susceptibility to come forward the perthes disease phenotype will not be shown so this genetic susceptibility to environmental trigger we'll try to break it down so etiology wise genetically we could be having a mutation in the type 2 collagen or other hereditary factors which lead to a mutation in the type 2 collagen now this was found very commonly in the asian population but rest of the population did not show a uh, say a mutation which led to this particular a uh, disease okay then it was told that insulin like growth factor 1 pathway which all of us know that igf1 pathway is important for the growth of both bones and the brain now if there was an abnormality in this particular uh, igf1 then it was told that both the bone and the brain will not work which will lead to hyperactivity or sort of a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in this particular children which would lead to subclinical trauma due to the hyperactivity and this subclinical trauma would lead to femoral head disvascularity okay so this was these were the genetic susceptibilities what were the other problems apart from uh, say the collagen structure and the uh, enzymes it was the blood itself